uh, the existing uh, buildings and the state they were in and uh, our attempt to actually make sense. The idea is that uh, only through adaptive reuse are we able to kind of give life uh, to be to these buildings. But we've also taken the stance that you don't need to imitate the buildings as they are, but you have to bring something new and contemporary, something of your times to the project as well. So uh, what we started out with was these three uh, individual buildings uh, which were not even connected, uh, just placed next to each other. We uh, added this small connecting piece, which was all in exposed concrete to express that it's made in our time. We added a fourth unit because there's a requirement for a multi-purpose hall. And because there was a group of trees in the middle, we left a kind of courtyard between that and that. But it's exactly the same size. The, the most important thing then that happens is that those existing verandas are connected and kind of that uh, veranda is extended and wraps around the new addition that we have and that flows out eventually into a, a plinth and an, uh, which becomes a pool deck as well as an amphitheater connecting all these buildings together. In section it also is kind of interesting because the existing buildings had this large kind of heavy wall which divided the space into two kind of parts. Uh, so uh, what we did essentially is we through kind of a structural uh, jugglery in the center, we opened these spaces out at the lower level where they could work as one larger space. One of them has the addition of a mezzanine that was added in that. And the new addition that we did is interesting because uh, we tried to kind of just change the spatiality of from what you feel in the existing building to the new building. And what we did is we took the profile of the existing building and flipped it 180 degrees. That's the dotted line you see in red. And uh, the, the roof just reverses essentially from what it was. And that begins to bring in both light and views uh, into this uh, room. And I will show you images of that in a second. So uh, these are slices uh, through the kind of entire configuration. And you can see the idea is always to kind of establish relationships to the outside uh, through kind of that space, the top image, of course, through the reading room, uh, which is the new loft we've added or this kind of compressed experience you get walking through the concrete kind of box, as well as uh, the last image which shows uh, the kind of space of the new multi-purpose hall. So these are the kind of three. So essentially it's got a multi-purpose hall. It's got indoor sports, wet areas, a changing rooms, a steam sauna space and a gymnasium, which overlooks a kind of small pool here. So this is the components of uh, the entire project and the structural system that kind of uh, constitutes uh, the kind of new uh, system that's been adopted. This is what emerges essentially uh, that continuous uh, veranda which links all these things and the component each of the three buildings retains their identity as it was. This is the connecting uh, veranda and it's new avatar. Very interesting again like you saw earlier there are a lot of other buildings which are similar so you actually just reused all the stone uh, bases, the wood, the plinth stones, uh, the rafters, that the wood uh, decking, fascias, everything has been reused from the earlier building. So we actually kind of almost got a new building or the new veranda actually emerges from just reusing a lot of those components from the earlier, uh, the existing buildings which are there. So the coping stone, everything is actually something which exists. This is the, the kind of uh, gap between the old and the new. You can see the concrete kind of box uh, on the left and the new addition on the right. This is from within uh, one of the kind of concrete boxes. So really scale down openings, connections happen only when you actually shift from standing to, to kind of sitting and kind of inhabiting that space, pausing uh, <clears throat> to use that space. This is the, uh, the loft, the reading room, which was kind of added. Uh, here you can very clearly see the steel structure that was added into that older space. Uh, we wanted to use these uh, lovely heritage tiles, uh, didn't have a budget, but still made sure we kind of got these little patches on the floor, which kind of really show that uh, it is almost like, you know, light streaming through and kind of lighting up uh, things from the past within. Uh, these are uh, smaller vignettes of those spaces. This is the gym area. So again, you can see the steel uh, like this uh, kind of composite flitched beam, which uh, 
kind of transfers the load of the wooden truss onto that. This is, of course, the reverse thing with the amphitheater. This is the new multipurpose hall. These large sliding doors which just open out and kind of release space to connect to the courtyard and the pool deck beyond. Uh, two kind of uh, unbuilt projects, really going through them uh, quickly just to make you understand uh, that how this is, this, this uh, ideas are explored at kind of varied scales. This is a project uh, we did, <clears throat> we were asked to do in kind of one week uh, for Mahindra and Mahindra, so it's a really quick kind of a charrette. Uh, they wanted to do kind of a museum for their cars and the first thing we did was kind of re- uh, label it as a museum of mobility because one really doesn't know where uh, the future of cars is in some sense, you know. While they were interested only in the past, we thought it's kind of good to have your eye on the future as well. Uh, their brand identity is uh, the word rise and um, it's about raising people in their standards but also we thought that it's a great thing to look at the idea of cars uh, which can actually uh, be kind of taken and exhibited through uh, the kind of museum. So the, the museum actually is a floor which is continuously rising. So this is something you would perceive from kind of a car and like what is your first encounter with this? And I mean, you would see this kind of uh, building that uh, say has like this blimp which calls itself out, proclaims its presence uh, in that landscape. Uh, it was a site uh, which had this existing kind of water body which is like a low-lying place which collected water over there, so we're basically essentially working uh, with that. Uh, so what we were trying to do is that to bring back this culture of the car in some sense and reflecting uh, about what it has been in the past. It's the idea of a driving cinema that people would gather through where automobiles come and park themselves, but also related to say what Mahindra is increasingly getting uh, kind of uh, engaged in, which is the cultural space. They hold a lot of these Kabir festivals or the blue shows where you could use this space as kind of an outdoor space uh, as well. Uh, this is kind of the entrance uh, where we, which you enter through and you see this kind of large hovering mass above you. This is where you kind of uh, would enter through. And essentially the floor is a continuously rising ramp. Uh, cars can essentially, uh, you know, be displayed on surfaces which are non-flat in some sense, but more importantly for us, is for visitors to actually feel as they walk through that space, through that experience of it, to bodily feel in their bodies this act of rising up and rising through space. So the idea was that how do you connect brand to experience and again like idea to experience. So you'd come up to the top uh, over here and you'd follow this kind of water channel down uh, back to the ground. Uh, in the center of course is this kind of amphitheater for car launches or more cultural kind of events that they would hold. So uh, what we had essentially was this idea that it's kind of this uh, large space which may get really kind of, uh, you know, uh, sunlit and uh, harsh. Whereas that uh, blimp you saw earlier could really just be pulled down and that blimp actually uh, kind of creates shade within. So you get this kind of dynamic kind of sense within the building. It's, the building is not a constant kind of uh, space. This is the kind of, of course, the cafe which happens on the underside of that space. And that the building goes and then meets the ground and uh, meets that water. So this kind of connection you get between water, earth and sky kind of gets established over here. So this is a really kind of quick uh, proposal. It's like just throwing out an idea of what could really kind of happen if you want to do something like this. Uh, and this is the last thing we're going to show. Uh, uh, this is a competition that was held a while back for uh, uh, the ad main administrative building uh, for Satara city. Uh, we were kind of shortlisted in the top 12 and essentially it talks about democracy. And uh, uh, that's kind of the proposal uh, that we had kind of actually come about. And I'm going to just kind of quickly tell you where that comes from. Uh, so if you look at the preamble of the constitution, it talks about we the people. And I think that's something that's really forgotten in all our public buildings that the, the buildings that are done by the government are actually for we the people. And there is really no way that uh, buildings uh, uh, engage with this public. 
so we are very keen that uh, we actually hand back a space that is more public space uh, than only kind of a government building which people kind of hate going to the second thing that we are really interested in that uh, is what kind of sherry anstein in uh, 1969 had kind of come up with is that how do you uh, engage with public how does government and uh, the citizen actually engage with each other and uh, so uh, they talk about that there are these kind of eight levels which are of this rungs of the ladder where you have to go from where say the government is kind of manipulating you uh, to a, a final state for example uh, where that citizens could actually begin to have kind of control and i mean we all know where we are currently in this kind of ladder i mean uh, we know what kind of the government is currently but the idea was that how can this change in the future and what kind of spaces do we need to allow for this kind of uh, changed uh, engagement between government and citizens basically uh, so we were looking at uh, two very simple examples uh, that how do people gather and this idea that right from uh, kind of olden times where a shamiana was used as a seat of governance which you find in these kind of miniature paintings or this kind of simple gathering under the shade basically which happens even in kind of small panchayats and villages at the same time we are looking at very kind of local examples one is of ajinkya fort uh, in satara itself which is this kind of uh, one of uh, the gods which shivaji built uh, which is this kind of ascent Uh, through the fort and its walls to the top of the uh, mountain basically so it's the idea of climbing up and similarly the shetra mauli temple which is these kind of steps on the ghats which take you from the river up uh, towards the temple so you're looking at these two models and trying to see how you can you know bring all these ideas together and essentially there are three important things one is this idea of shade the shade that is created under this kind of large canopy and satara has this beautiful kind of temperate climate where you don't need air conditioning much and you can actually use uh, a lot of activities to happen in the outdoor so how can you essentially create shade and allow for non structured activity the 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 second one is this idea of uh, ascent which is uh, where you climb up the building to actually see something so this is like on the side plan you can see it has these kind of diagonal views towards ajinkya tara and again using this idea of uh, what steven hall talks about phenomena to actually root your building in context that it creates these kind of diagonal views to orient yourself and situate yourself uh, to this views to ajinkya tara basically and then of course the two buildings on the side which support the act of governance so that's kind of the building uh, which you can see you can see ajinkya tara on the right this whole kind of uh, canopy like very light fabric like uh, roof under which uh, in the center you see is this completely open uh, terraced cascading kind of space where a multitude of activities can happen and uh, in that gap between kind of the blue canopy and the white canopy is where uh, kind of the council chamber happens and legislation happens which is again transparent and exposed to public to see and kind of in sense visually at least in the first stage visually participate uh, in the act of governance so this is kind of the ground floor large open kind of public spaces and till this kind of uh, red line this is all public we added things like a children's uh, e kind of civic library which allows youngsters to participate at a very young age the fear of government is kind of taken away from them and then the building kind of keeps stepping back as you go up Uh, allowing for the center to become a space where people could spill out from both sides and uh, for citizens and government to participate in this kind of uh, neutral space also as you see that the center because it kind of is in the middle receives less light uh, we began to situate the large requirement for storage and filing uh, within this so it kind of deals with that kind of uh, dead space in some sense also the two cores which you can see in the diagrams on the right hand side are not symmetrical and are placed slightly off center to be able to create what we called a uh, different scales of neighborhood of office spaces so you had a very small medium large kind of office space instead of this kind of very large floor plate which you kind of find in it building so it scales down the building into the smaller neighborhoods of activity and work so this is a kind of a cut section you can begin to see this kind of terraces cascading and 
this kind of continuous movement that slowly kind of takes you up all the way where eventually on that top terrace you begin to kind of uh, get views of uh, ajinkya terrace so this is the kind of second last floor there cafeteria is essentially something we thought after ask it become a restaurant so people can actually come there even when the building is actually a uh, close and the top center portion which you see and that angular kind of cut is actually uh, the building actually receding back allowing those views to be directed uh, towards ajinkya tara in some sense and the final floor of course becomes the larger council chambers and uh, meeting rooms that happen so here you can see that in these kind of cascading terraces and in the building across which is really thin width uh, and transparent you can see governance in action you see governance being made transparent and people participating in what uh, the government is actually kind of beginning to do for you uh, in this kind of very sheltered open kind of uh, place uh, these are the kind of sides uh, which basically uh, also kind of pick up on that terracing aspect on the outside giving these large uh, terraces for the people within the working staff to actually come out for a little break as well so uh, just to end again very quickly uh, ideas can be really simple but they can also be very complex and they can be multi layered and they can contain uh, many kind of several smaller ideas within them uh, they can come from any place inspiration can kind of strike from wherever you wish uh, but right ideas uh, can come from asking the right questions and i think that's very very important uh, ideas are not preconceived but several times discovered it's not that you start with today i am going to do this idea no you work the site and the program and you discover an idea that is relevant from asking the right questions and ideas should uh, be adaptable and kind of changeable through the course of design in some sense and of course there are many more but i think it will be i thought it was a good way to kind of uh, tie back from kind of where we started yeah so that's it for us for now so sorry geeta for taking up a little bit more time not at all i think uh, it was great uh... and uh, we ended on a good note where you asked saying good ideas come from good questions so let's hear it uh, from whoever has questions i think uh, rama will uh, take take us through the questions and then nandu uh, will conclude yes thank you uh, thank you uh, so much uh, marketing shilpa and sandesh for the inspiring presentation so to start out with i had a question um, in the collage house we saw amazing innovation come up with a lot of um, waste materials and and um, elements sourced from different time periods in different contexts now was it ever a concern for you that um, uh, different contexts are coming together in a new context so different historical links are being taken and put in one uh, space now there are many perspectives that may say that uh, no elements and context must be frozen in the time and age that they were in and you should be able to identify them by looking at the context itself was this ever a concern uh, for you or um, did the entire act of innovating based out of waste and sensitively take precedence over this historical aspect uh i think yeah since it was not uh, a kind of a pure conservation project by a far stretch but uh, where i think uh, links to history uh, and meaning are far more uh, critical in some sense uh, the fact that this was a new building uh, we did not consider it to be kind of uh, as uh, sacred by a far stretch the emphasis uh, of course was that how do you uh, bring together dif different kind of things and things was not uh, necessarily objects in the sense of material but how can you even collage history or how can you collage memory together you know that you actually pick up on links of different time periods like very much like you said but uh, how can you begin to try and uh, through this kind of random juxtaposition try and create opportunities for contemporary times to read new meanings into them so i think it if of it offers you that opportunity opens that window and i think then people uh, kind of read different things into it you know uh, you want to add to that like i think a lot of people have uh, seen uh, a lot of reminiscences to old parts of bombay especially a lot of seniors uh, who visited the project uh, 
keep telling them it reminds them of things uh, of going to older parts of mumbai and kind of visiting those areas and stuff like that so but there are others who have read the project kind of quite differently you know i mean so people see it as uh, like star trek meets uh, you know like a rigveda time kind of a thing so it's it, there is everybody has had very very different reactions to this and also i think to just uh, kind of continue with that we've had this uh, reaction uh, about the building where people have either hated the building or they really love it you know it kind of uh, kind of uh, has these extreme reactions in some sense so and i think in some sense it may kind of answer that question no agreed uh, it was definitely never a thing about uh, making lessons in history and here this is from this era and please get familiar with our history no not at all i think i think it was more about just memories and nostalgia and the sense of overlapping new with old and how seamlessly the two can blend into each other uh, without making you uh, feel that we have consciously used old and we consciously used that that's not the idea you're finally living in today's time but with a hint of nostalgia right, right. so in a sense it becomes a work of art which is creating new meanings for everyone who comes and visits each it. one each one who goes around connects you're right yeah very good so um, there is a question related to kulas house uh, which is by um, ियल factors obviously so how did you deal with that so uh, i think uh, one advantage we had is that the the front of the building was facing north uh, so that uh, helped greatly uh, in terms of uh, you know just uh, pure kind of onset of rain in some sense onslaught of the rain uh, which is there uh, yeah. but in terms of construction uh, yeah it was interesting because uh, there are kind of no precedents you know to this uh, and people spoke about that uh, wall section which uh, was very kind of important for us to uh, discover in some sense uh, because normally what you have uh, especially the way these windows are used is uh, you have a heavy wall within which the the window is inset uh, where here, there is no wall which surround these windows uh, and uh, like shilpa explained it's suspended it's kind of hung in front like a curtain wall is hung in front of uh, you know a building in a, at a slab so it's connected at the top bottom and at the slab thickness itself so there's actually a steel framework uh, within which these windows are set and uh, honestly we were also fairly foxed uh, when we were kind of working with this uh, and i must credit uh greatly the kind of carp- carpenters and the craftsmen who were working on this uh, who we were constantly interacting with uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, these old windows are something they were really far more familiar with than we were and uh, through a series of dialogues and exchanges uh, we collectively kind of worked out this uh, method where we could actually you know inset every w- window within this larger metal framework which is structural but the whole thing becomes kind of far more uh, seamless as well you know and is able to kind of transfer uh, loads so yeah i mean i think it's it's a back, lot of back and forth a lot of learning for us uh, honestly where uh, i mean we keep talking about this in a lot of other lectures as well that uh, it's uh, i mean we as a firm uh, like like to draw a lot and try and anticipate problems uh, before taking them to site but this project at several levels has forced us to de-learn this you know a very modernist kind of way of uh, trying to resolve everything up front in your studio uh, but rather take it to site interact with the craftsmen and people who are working there and then through those inputs uh, work out yeah, evolve solutions uh, which help you kind of take that ahead you know yeah, thank you so much that that answer thank you shruti for the question uh, so there's a question about uh, the uh, the windows whether all of them are openable or uh, is it a facade uh, uh, i think you mentioned that all were openable each and every one of them is open yeah okay wow fact uh, for people who are interested uh, there are some uh, interesting videos uh, which are you can find on youtube 
uh, where you can actually see a lot of these windows open and close in action. So you can like uh, not take a word, but uh, see it, uh, you know, in uh, person. I mean, there's also this uh, uh, episode on Netflix for people who are interested. Uh, world's most extraordinary homes. Uh, in season two, there's a whole episode on India. Uh, the house is covered within that as the last house, the fourth house in that episode, where you also see these windows in action, you know. So people interested, please go look at these. It may help your experience of the house. And we visited the house often enough later and seen that uh, people, the users of the house actually open up the windows. AC is oh. very, very rarely because it's already on top of a hill. So the windows are just open because the other side windows lead to the courtyard, so which is again breezy. Right. Okay, so I think um, we are seeing a lot of abstraction also come through, which leads to Shivani Chauhan's question. Shivani, would you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, uh, hello. Yeah, I want to ask the... Uh, how important do you think abstraction is in architecture? Like these ideas just naturally comes to you or like do you sketch a lot in an abstract form and then you come and evolve the entire idea? Yeah, a great question. Actually, very interesting uh, kind of connecting back to the idea of uh, ideas itself. Yeah, so definitely abstraction is essential. And uh, why is it essential is that uh, you need to look beyond the thing itself, to look at what is uh, at the back of it, right? What is driving it? What is the core of it? Uh, there's a term we use a lot called uh, deep structure, for example. What is at the root of this, right? So uh, uh, sketching, drawing, of course, uh, is a very, very important part of that process. Uh, like we said, uh, they are not a prior, right? Like you don't start saying when you get a new project, Ki achha, uh, abhi, I'm going to try out this idea. No, that's not how it works. Uh, you examine what the client wants, what their needs are, climate, uh, bylaws, uh, what consultants are telling you. And through all this, you begin to ask questions. And those questions are essentially, eventually, because we are all architects, uh, lead to drawings. The drawings are sketches. The sketches intentionally leave out certain things and in that they become abstract and they focus on certain other things essential. which are yeah exactly the essential things which are there and uh, that's when you begin to kind of test whether uh, through that kind of uh, abstraction one is able to derive or extract the essence of things you know it's almost like peeling away what is unnecessary till you reach to the core of the idea and then you just leave that much so that it doesn't look embellished but it looks for what it is and what it's needed okay okay thank you yeah thank you so much for the question and uh, so we have a couple of more questions on the collage house which seems to uh, have intrigued everyone so there is one question on the fun bathroom. Could you elaborate on the process of creating that? And the other question is on the uh, about the overhead tank for the collage house. Could you explain more about it? These two questions. Yeah. So uh, the the fun toilet, I think, we is actually have more slides to for both of them, which we've not put. We should have yeah, explained but, it yeah. more. Elaboration. So I think it's very important for architects to have fun. So. Uh, I mean, as much as uh, we need to be very responsible in our actions, I think we are eventually all creative people and uh, using humor or having fun is an important part of what we do. And uh, this was kind of a place we thought it's a good kind of uh, nod in some sense to Mumbai's kind of Bollywood, uh, you know, history also in some sense. We were also uh, confronted with a toilet. Uh, this particular one is a powder toilet, for example, not used too much, uh, which didn't have an external window. And uh, the idea was that how do you create an experience which is uh, memorable for people who kind of visit? So we had a lot of these uh, uh, mirrors which the client had, which were wasted and uh, which could be reused in some sense. We also, like Shilpa was mentioning earlier, trying to address how do you kind of look at things that were happening historically earlier. So we took these glasses, kind of put them together. Each of those glasses is kind of individually cut. Each of them is actually beveled as well. So it becomes like this uh, sheesh mahal, you know, which we used to have in older... And again, made precious again, no? 
so through that uh, reference to again history in some sense this, this notion of a sheesh mahal and then okay how do you light it how do you kind of occupy it right so i mean sheesh mahals have these stories of where they would get one diya and they put it in that space and that one diya would pick up a million reflections you know so we worked with that idea of kind of okay what if you have a single kind of light source we also needed functional things like a place to put the napkin to put the kind of soap dispenser to put the towel the tissue holder so i mean there was this idea of this funky kind of uh, pink tube pink tube that kind of you know goes through that entire space which brings all these kind of elements together you know i mean so again there's like a smaller idea within that kind of larger sense of things which uh, you know is kind of having fun i mean it and essentially it's about creating surprise you you open a door and you walk into an experience which you didn't imagine that you would have you know and that leaves a kind of memory with uh, somebody who uh, has gone through that experience and they take back take that back with them you know so it's i think it's important for us to as architects to kind of think of this kind of diversity of experiences that one can uh, create you know yeah and the other question was to do with uh, the water tank i mean so just to elaborate a little bit on what kushal pad already said is that uh, we were on a site visit one day with my engineer and uh, the top slab was actually not cast you know and there was this beautiful and it was in the afternoon and this beautiful light which was coming all the way to the ground floor of that staircase and there's a really small gap it's like a 8 inch gap between the wall and the staircase but light was finding its way all the way to the bottom and uh, it was really fascinating as an experience and uh, our engineer rajiv was actually saying that pinkish you have to kind of do this you have to leave that top open and it's like what a wonderful experience this is and i just shoot him off saying that oh no 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 all the drawings are done and we knew it was complex because it was the, a water tank yeah it was a water so tank so. and there was a lot of services on the roof there was uh you know the ac plant was there the kind of tank for the solar water heater was there so it was a little tricky to actually work that through and uh, uh i said no nothing doing we can't change anything and like you know we all went back home and uh that night i couldn't sleep because just that sheer experience of seeing that light coming down was so interesting you know and then the next by day we kind of went back to the drawing board and we said okay, we have to make this happen i mean what can you do and after a lot of jugglery we realized that uh you know we can't give up too much space so we said okay theek hai jitna bhi hota hai utna so we kind of left this small slit you know which was there so so it, like at least at uh, 12 noon uh, you would kind of get this uh, light actually beginning to stream in and then we said okay the light has to find its way and it needs to spread and that's how that curve emerged you know i mean and then if, because the curve emerged we said okay what if it's something really light and then uh, that lightness led to a fabric like thing and then we were experimenting with a lot of construction techniques anyway in the house and then he said can you actually cast a slab with fabric and then we did a lot of experiments with that so we used tarpaulin uh, which is like a tougher fabric uh, which you could use as a method to cast so one thing leads to the other and this is what we spoke about earlier that we Absolutely. like uh, accidents to happen accidents happen and this is so much more tactile in its nature and uh, so much more evoking and for a heavy thing like a water tank it feels as if it's just a little light sail lighter. you know i mean sometimes so so the idea is to be open to processes and allow accidents random occurrences to happen because we think they eventually enrich the process and they enrich the experience for people right right thank you so much on uh, that uh, i think um, we are really pressed for time but i'll just take one more question because talking about processes the housing project brought in a lot of very interesting participatory processes and very democratic in a sense where you gave choice to the people who are inhabiting the spaces as to how they wanted to get a uh, more of a sense of belonging now the question is uh, also pratiksha uh, sorry uh, suti gar is asking how can this practically be implemented because we don't see such participatory processes in housing especially which are very common so how how was how difficult was it or what was the process of um, you know working in uh, tandem with the builder uh, in uh, making this happen this participatory process happen uh difficult 
because uh, everybody wants to take the easiest route you know i mean uh, clients do uh, architects also do uh, what this meant for us is actually doing far many more drawings than uh, saying that there's only one solution and you duplicated it like 100 times it forced us to draw multiple options of this which means more work for the architect but uh, i think that if we think that is important uh, this is something we must do as professionals it also meant uh, difficulty for the client because uh, he had to source multiple materials create multiple inventories of these things uh, and you know implement them through different uh, kind of uh, crafts people on site as well so uh, yes it is not easy uh but uh, like i mentioned if it's if we think it's important uh, we have to find the kind of ways to do it uh however besides this i think one uh, big hurdle that which we actually faced in real time was uh, uh the kind of dynamic of developer projects uh, where uh, not everything is uh, sold up front i mean we this works really well where you know your client base and you could have actually have interacted with them far more you know even in the creation of the templates the the kind of five uh, kit of parts uh, that we call that which is offered for each of this even those can actually be uh, created in dialogue with the users or the participants but here uh, because we are operating in a void because it's a developer kind of speculative context one doesn't know who the buyer is you know uh and the the developers not always keen for you as a professional to interact with them directly so i think that's kind of one hurdle the second hurdle we really faced was uh the first set of houses in phase 1 sold fairly well and they kind of uh allowed people to participate in choosing but at some point sale didn't keep up with construction uh which means we had to finish the building but uh, there are no buyers you know and in a speculative market that's something that one encounters you know at which point we and everybody in the office had to become this kind of uh, pseudo buyer and you started picking combinations to but kind of put together yeah majority of them yeah, yeah i mean of course a majority of them have happened through that but i'm i'm just talking of it difficulties was, or hurdles you know that one faces in terms of it was slightly it. easier because of the skit of parts notion where certain railings and certain wind breakers at least some things and the screens for your window panels that was easy to retrofit in but sometimes when a decision of how the terrace was to put in yes some those decisions were taken before